Unit 2, Biodiversity Review. I just want to cover a few um, points that I think will be really important for your test on Thursday. So the first thing that we started off talking about was biodiversity in general. There are three different forms of biodiversity. Um, we can have diversity within the genetics, we can have diversity among the species, and then just diversity in the habitat as a whole. Um, each of these forms will play a role in the survival of the population and ultimately the survival of that ecosystem. As ecosystems undergo changes over time, organisms have to be able to withstand those changes, and if they can't, then they perish and go extinct. And so ultimately, I think the biggest take home from Unit 2 is understanding that the greater the biodiversity, the greater the resilience. And so as we look in the future at things where humans are impacting and deteriorating the degree of biodiversity, ultimately what we are doing is we are deteriorating our resilience of our biosphere. Um, species that lack genetic diversity, for example, this cornfield is monoculture. It's, it has no genetic diversity within it. Each of those stocks are genetically um, hybrid, so they're genetically the same. They lack genetic diversity, and so you're going to have an increased susceptibility to disease and ultimately the extinction of that particular um, crop. Um, you can see the fungus has affected not just one kernel, one, not just one stalk there, but every single stalk you can see in that picture. Biological diversity um, is determined by two things. If you think back to our parking lot biodiversity lab, we measured the amount of richness. That was just the number of different species. But then we also looked at the evenness, the population size, or the population number of each of those species. And Shannon Werner Biodiversity Insect Index uses both of those. Um, for example, I could ask a question such as which ecosystem has greater biodiversity? Um, if you look at ecosystem A and B, both have five different species. However, ecosystem B has greater evenness among those five species, and therefore ecosystem B would have the highest biodiversity. Ecosystem services, these are super important, and I think we'll need to come back to these um, frequently. These are services that ecosystems provide for us. Um, they give us provisioning services. These are provide us with product such as food or water. They provide support services, and these are those how they cycle nutrients, how they provide um, store energy through primary productivity, how they form soil. The third service they provide is regulating, and a lot of the regulating services we don't realize an ecosystem is even giving us until it's gone. So for example, we remove or change the landscape, and then we experience flooding because the landscape actually helped regulate flood. Um, all of the insects go extinct. Well, then farmers are going to have to figure out a way to pollinate their crops in order to have um, a product. And so our ecosystem provides a lot of regulating services. And then the last one is cultural services. These are um, the recreational, the educational, the aesthetic, um, spiritual, we go to the park, we enjoy being outdoors. Um, if I were to ask you these three questions, A, spending a day in the park is an example of which ecosystem service? You would say cultural. B, bats, consuming insects that carry disease. This is a regulating service. Um, we would have to use some insecticide if we didn't have those bats. And then C, harvesting apples for food, is an example of provisioning services. Island biogeography theory. Basically, there's two main pieces here. Um, organisms from mainland are going to either drift through the ocean or they're going to drift through wind currents, and they're going to um, land on these islands. The closer the island, the higher the number of species. The larger the island, the higher the number of species. And so if you put this together and you think about the underlying theme that greater biodiversity means more resilience, then you could say that islands with greater biodiversity are going to be more resilient 
and those islands are also going to be larger and they're going to be closer to mainland. Smaller islands, and those further away from mainland, are most likely to experience decline from a disturbance. So the larger, the closer islands are going to be able to withstand some disturb disturbances easier than those smaller, further away islands. Um, as more and more organisms immigrate into an island, you're going to actually see that immigration numbers will go down as the resources and the space start to run out in competition increases, and therefore then you're going to see an increase in extinction. When these two lines intersect, that's when we have reached this thing called equilibrium. Um, every organism has a range that is optimal for its survival. So for example, pH or temperature, this optimal range is that range of that environmental factor in which the organism is most suited and is most successful at living. When an organism is pushed outside that optimal range, we would identify that as being stress added to this organism. Um, some organisms are gonna be able to survive slightly outside that range for maybe a short period of time, but over time um, they will become intolerant and ultimately will not be able to survive if they're pushed too far outside of their optimal range. When environmental factors change, um, it becomes a stress. And so environmental stress is what actually drives evolution or change in species over time. The thing I really want you to think about here though when we're looking at tolerance is also comparing it to this idea of competition because organisms don't typically exist isolated from other organisms and we don't want them to because the greater the biodiversity uh, the greater the resilience is but you have to remember that in this graph down here we have species a which is the smaller darker hump that's indicating a soil moisture range that it's optimal in and then species b starts right here and you can see some of the overlap um, and it goes all the way up here. So species B actually can survive in a much broader range. However, if you look over time, once you place these two species together, you're, you're, they're overlapping. And so that means that they're, they're going to have to compete for whatever that environmental factor is. Um, whichever one's better at competing is the one that's going to survive. And in this case, you can see that species A stayed pretty much in the same um, soil moisture range. And species B moved. Species B basically got pushed out of species A optimal range because the individuals that were surviving in that same optimal range, well, now they had to compete species A. And species A was just a better competitor. And I can tell that because species B now exists within a much narrower um, optimal range of soil moisture because they, they, could, they could survive at a lower, lower soil moisture if species A wasn't there um, to outcompete them. So competition does play a range, does have an effect on an organism's tolerance also. Um, disturbances are going to be natural. Um, they also are obviously going to be human created and we will get into those more as we move through the course. The two big things that I really want you to think about when you're thinking about a disturbance here is its comeback, its ability to withstand a disturbance. Um, two words that I think are important is resistance. Is an ecosystem resistant to um, a particular uh, disturbance. Resistance is going to be that measurement of how much an ecosystem changes after the disruption. So if there's forest fire, um, so for example, I know we hear about the forest fires out in the western states, however seeing it firsthand, um, they were very resistant to it and the resilience is going to be great. I, you go back within a year's time you're going to have quite a bit of regrowth in the area that I saw because it was lower in the foothills. Um, you definitely will see less resistance, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it won't be resilient to come back. 
Resilience is a measure of how quick the ecosystem can succeed following a disturbance. So for example, in 1980, there was an, a volcanic eruption. We had a very high number of plant species following the eruption. It declined greatly. So you almost have um, a situation of secondary succession here, and then the, the number starts to incline again. In the graph, you can see that the ecosystem was not resistant to the volcanic eruption. However, it does show that it's resilient as the number of producers present continue to increase each year. So from 1983, 1984, and so on, the number of producers that are present are increasing each year, moving back towards the climax community. Um, adaptations, we talked about this slide before. Um, just adaptations are how organisms adapt to an ecosystem, and the ecosystem is what's going to give or determine which traits are the adaptations. So, for example, the ground cover is dark, the predator is adding the selective pressure, the dark mice can camouflage in with the dark background, therefore the lighter mice become um, the individuals that are captured at a higher rate. These dark mice are not turning dark because they're sitting on dark background. They are dark because they have that genetic variation. That genetic variation gives them an advantage at surviving, and therefore we say that is their adaptation. Your opposable thumb is your adaptation because it allowed you to complete tasks more efficiently, tasks that are necessary to our survival, hunting, gathering, um, using tools, and therefore our opposable thumb is an adaptation that is advantageous for us. Um, the long neck in the giraffe is an adaptation because the environmental pressure was food availability. It was only high in trees. Giraffes with long necks could reach the food, they could survive, they could reproduce, passing on their long neck traits while the short-necked giraffes were dying of starvation and they were unable to pass on their genetic traits. Um, in a much shorter scale, you can see that uh, you have two graphs here. Uh, you can see the number of finches in this first graph. This is before a drought. There are up to 90 here on the side. Um, in the second graph, it only goes up to 12. And so clearly before drought, after drought, what effect did the drought have on the size of the bird population? Well, if you just look at the outline in red, you might not really see this. You have to look at the numbers. So when you're reading graphs, there's a lot of graph reading the data questions on this test. Um, just make sure you're looking at the X and Y values. You're reading everything that's there. You can see that the drought dramatically affected the size of the population, decreasing it after the drought. Um, what effect did the drought have on the size of the bird beak? Well, Indirectly, the drought um, caused the size of the bird's beak. The average size of the bird beak actually became larger. Why? Because the drought produced larger seeds with harder shells. Birds with larger beaks were able to actually gather and eat that food. Um, those with smaller beaks were not as successful and therefore died out. And so following a drought, the size of the bird's beak increased um, from up here about an average size of nine and a half to down here, the average size, our most common size, um, was actually above 10 millimeters. And then the last section um, had to do with succession. And that is just putting kind of it all together when there is a disruption, if there is great biodiversity, if organisms are adapted to the area um, and they have a larger tolerance range, they're going to be able to come back. They're going to bounce back. Primary succession was um, starting from absolutely no life, so bedrock, um, and building up through a progression that you guys looked at. You can't all of a sudden have trees before you have um, mosses and lichens, lichens and mosses and grasses. You have to, it has to go through a progression. Um, in this particular graph, you can see we started off early within just a few years. There were um, plants such as the sweet gum and the tulip poplar, um, the red maple 
those, the red maple um, definitely liked it when there was not a lot of competition. Um, richness is maximized at about a 